Good and dying. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to, Re to Reykjavik also from my side. Uh, I was just introduced, so I'm Sebastian Rude, and I'm actually, um, I will introduce in the next 20 minutes um, Victis Finburgerdotter here sitting here with us and who will officially open the conference. And also the World Language Center, which carries her name. And that is what I direct, but I will explain that in a little bit more detail. So I guess Iceland is perhaps not an obvious place for having a conference dedicated to language. Of course, lately it has been a very popular place. Tourists are coming, many, many of them uh, lately. And uh, so also many events are hosted here, um, partly because it is so conveniently located between uh, the uh, North American continent and uh, the rest of, of Europe. I must not say Europe because Iceland is a part of Europe. Um, indeed, Iceland owes its very existence, at least in part, to the fact that exactly here the two continental plates drift apart, the North American and the Europe one. So you can see that throughout the country, uh, most famously, of course, at Tingvetir. Uh, but you all crossed this divide when you came from Keplavik here to Reykjavik, indeed. Um, but languages, what does Iceland have to do with languages? Indeed, when I taught linguistics courses and I wanted to break the prejudice that one country, one language. So in France you, you speak French and in Germany you speak German and so forth. So I, I, I challenged my student, can you, can you name me a country where only one language is spoken? And um, Iceland was always a very good candidate, but Actually, uh, this is so wrong in so many ways. So for a first thing, you see two dots on this Icelandic map. And the second dot is, of course, for, for the Icelandic sign language, the second native language of Iceland, which is around here. But then also, there are, of course, many languages spoken by immigrants like myself. So recently, school children have been asked uh, which languages they speak at home. And guess what? They received almost a hundred different answers in this small community of barely over 300,000 people. So this year is a very polyglottic country, at least, as are basically all countries in the world nowadays. So, but most importantly, it is wrong because Icelanders have a very special relationship with language, with their own language, but they care also a lot about other languages. So, of course, Icelandic is famously the language of the sagas. And it is said that Icelandic changed so little over the last 800 years, at least in its writing, that Icelanders are still able to read the sagas in their original form, which were written in the 12th or 13th century. If you want to know how amazing that is, try to read something which was written in your language 800 years ago. Good luck with that. Um, the Icelandic maintained itself quite independent, very differently from the other Germanic languages. And it is quite pure, so to say. So Icelandic really avoids loanwords. This here is the word for computer, and it is a very nicely made word. And many others of those you will find if you, uh, when you learn Ice language, uh, uh, the Icelandic language. So um, sometimes perhaps the Icelanders exaggerate a little bit. So if you... If you try to learn Icelandic, those words which go everywhere, they probably won't work here. But at the same time, uh, Icelandic has, by this way, developed a very rich, a very expressive, a very poetic language using uh, the combinations of words which other Germanic languages could do and some of them do. My mother tongue German is also famous, but it is really nothing compared to Icelandic. Um, one factor with this love for language is that Iceland is probably one of the most uh, alphabetized uh, countries in the world and it has been so since the Middle Ages. So literacy rates here were already very, very high even when the country was very pure on the outer edge of Europe. Almost everybody here now is to write and to read very early. And that is quite unique. Actually, until this day, this year is the country in the world where books and writing and reading is most valued of all countries in the world. But most famously, Icelandic managed to preserve itself despite the rule of the Danish realm, um, uh, to which it belonged for many, many centuries. So 
you see there is something special going on with Iceland and its language. On the other side, Icelandic has a long tradition of building bridges, of reaching out, of learning other languages, of translating things from other languages, of interacting with other languages. It is quite common for Icelanders to study here foreign languages, then go abroad for some years and come back with the knowledge and try to intermediate between different countries. And a very famous and very good example of that, um, of course, is uh, Victis Finnburger Dottir. Many of you probably have heard already of her because she was the first uh, female president of Iceland and actually she was the first female elected head of state anywhere in the world. Um, yeah, she has had very interesting encounters over the years. Perhaps you remember the beginning of the end of the Cold War was done here by a contract done uh, or first meetings done in Iceland and so forth. So. That is uh, quite remarkable. But much earlier before that, Victis was already a very remarkable person in the Icelandic society. She has studied French, the French language, and especially theater literature, not only in Iceland, but also abroad in Grenoble and at the Sorbonne in Paris. And she lived several years in Denmark and in France and has specialized in, in theater and theater literature there. When she came back to Iceland, then she taught French at high schools. She taught literature and theater at the Icelandic University. And she became the director of the Reykjavik Theater Company. She has tr translated several books and plays and poems and so forth into Icelandic. And she has always stressed during her years as a president and before and after the importance of, of cherishing your own language and of valorizing and, and learning other languages as well. Um, I guess perhaps most relevant for this audience is that after her presidency, uh, she became the UNESCO's goodwill ambassador for languages. There are some 80 or so UNESCO goodwill ambassadors around the world for several topics, and she is the one who cares of languages. Um, she has defended um, a number of important points as a goodwill ambassador. Of course, that language is really the most important key element for a culture. You can't transmit a culture without its proper language well. That no language is small, no language is unimportant. And well, Icelandic is always considered to be a small language, but of course, it is not even a language with few speakers. I will come to this in a minute. But uh, also that, the, the, uh, that linguistic diversity, small languages, or, uh, many, many languages, are important factor in human life, in human ecology, if you like. So she raised very early the concern for minority languages, for endangered languages. And uh, she stressed that language not only characterizes, but also connects culture. So if we exchange about our cultures, we use language, of course. And this holds particularly for multilingual individuals who build bridges between cultures by translation, by being there, interacting different languages. And this is what this very conference is all about. In recognition of that, in 2002, the University of Iceland named the Institute of Foreign Languages the Victis Finnburger Dotter Institute, of which I am not the director. <laughs> and they choose as the symbol the, the, the globe of the world, very, very fittingly. Some years later, uh, under the impression of the worldwide rising concern for endangered languages and for the first initiatives of language documentation, the idea was developed to establish, in addition to the Institute of Foreign Languages, also a center as a part of that institute. And in a, in a certain way, this center would continue Victis' work as an UNESCO ambassador, promoting linguistic diversity, language learning, and multilingualism, and intercultural understanding. So that was when the idea for a world language center was born. Um, that idea was presented in 2007 in an international conference in Iceland uh, at which I attended as a young uh, postdoc at, at, at that time. Um, of course, then the crisis hit and it hit Iceland in particularly uh, strong. So all the plans for the center got uh, delayed. 
but uh, in recent years they have restarted that those activities and they have involved UNESCO itself so there was an agreement between the Icelandic government and UNESCO to establish this center and then funds have been raised a lot of funds with help from Icelanders but also from people and institutions from abroad despite the crisis and um, in 2015 the construction work for the building which would host both institutions the Victis Finburger Dotter Institute of Foreign Languages and the Victis World Language Center which in the meantime has changed its official names in the agreement with UNESCO so now the official name is the Victis International Center for Multilingualism and Intercultural Understanding. Um, the cornerstone was laid in 2016 a little bit over a year ago, that was the state of affairs. And then in April this year, the building and the center were officially opened. And that was also the point when I arrived in Iceland together with my wife. That, is, that are pictures from the opening conference where around a thousand people attended, many from abroad as well. And even the president of Iceland, Gutni Johansson, also uh, addressed uh, the audience and he confessed at that moment that he also at home translates and he is dedicated to translating Stephen King into Icelandic. <laughs> <laughs> so what does the center do? What is the center about? The themes of the center are of course linguistic diversity, the contact between languages and cultures. So to try to continue Victor's work and, and, and uh, dedication for that. Um, that holds on the worldwide scale, so being concerned with endangered languages, with diagnostic situations all around the world, but also on the individual level, with people who speak more than one language, multilingualism, that languages are bridges between cultures, we, we, we try to help to, to foster the importance of translations and of language learning. So that is why we came into contact, I said, when this conference was having here, oh, this is so wonderful, this is so close to what the center is about to do, so can we interact, can I present the center here? And I, I was invited to do so together with Victis opening this conference, an opportunity for which I thank very much indeed. So, linguistic diversity, I will say a few words about that. It all starts, of course, with the question, so how many languages, after all, are there? So, what is your goal? How many are there still missing? You have a checklist, right? There is such a checklist. <laughs> and uh, actually, the answer is that there are, more or less, surprisingly enough, as many languages in the world as we, as we can see uh, with the naked eye in the night sky throughout the year. There are around 6,500 languages in the world. That is the best estimation that we have. But of course, that's problematic, because what exactly do you count? So how many languages are there spoken in France? It starts with six, and you can try to figure out which six those are. But depending on how you count dialects and how different a dialect has to be from the main language, that you can up to count until 30 or 35 languages spoken in France, at least languages and dialects. Also. Um, we don't know of all the regions. So in the country where I have worked for a long time, there are still around 90 to 100 non-contacted groups, and we have no idea which languages they speak. Languages are very unevenly distributed over the globe. So I guess next uh, polyglot conference should be held in Papua New Guinea, the country with most languages in the world, or in Indonesia, or in Nigeria, or in Cameroon, or in India, or in Mexico. Those are the big players in linguistic diversity in the world. Languages are very unevenly distributed also in size. So we have, of course, quite a number of languages with only one or a very few speakers, and we have at least one language which has almost a billion speakers. So the average value, so most of the languages have actually less than 10,000 speakers because the median value for language size in the world is 7,000. So if you thought that Icelandic is a small language, um, <laughs> think again also in terms of a language with few speakers. It is not actually worldwide. Many of those languages are endangered, which means that in a couple of generations or three or four generations, they won't be around anymore. They won't be spoken anymore. And that holds, actually, if you extend that to five or six generations, that holds for more than 90% of the languages in the world. Um, that is actually my own field of expertise. I used to do field work in central Brazil, um, where I worked on the Abichi language, uh, which is uh, here in the Xingu area in central Brazil. So let's fly to 
Central Brazil, where you see the Xingu Park, which is the rainforest which is still there, that indigenous reserve, and then you go down this very curvous river, and then you come to this little village, and you are with the Avici people in Brazil. When I came there first, there were 80 people, 80 speakers of Avici. Right now, they have around 200 speakers, but they are, and they're still stable. All children are learning the languages, but uh, the language, but they are, of course, threatened by dramatic changes which are going on in Brazil. Also, the change of technology arriving in the villages, but that can also be used for the good, for, for strengthening and preserving and documenting the language and the culture. So, the activities of the center, uh, this was just one aspect, uh, one of linguistic diversity. Um, and that is what we want to do research on and then to get in cooperation to do research projects to multilingualism and intercultural understanding, of course. Um, we have an exposition, uh, an, an exposition room where we can show topics about this. Right now, there is an exhibition about Victis Finburger Dotter, so if you have a chance, you can visit that building. Uh, there are guided tours, and it's actually also worthwhile for its amazing architecture. Our dream is to have new language maps which show you guys, which show multilingualism, which show cities like New York being full of different languages and, and how can we visualize that and how can we put this on such a globe? That would be the dream. We also do events and a number of you have indeed attended one very nice event on Thursday evening when we had a Café Lingua. This, this happens twice a month, once a month in our institute, in our center, when people chat in different languages and learn other languages and so forth. So language lovers meet in Reykjavik twice a month actually. And very importantly, we are looking out for cooperation. So if you think, wow, this is interesting, I would like to be part of that, I would like to interact, I have this research project and I would like to do this with UNESCO or so, then please come to me. Also, if you know some rich sponsor or um, some institution who want to, to support our work, then please also get in contact with, with us. And with this, I conclude the presentation of the center which I lead and uh, I have introduced Victis Finburger Dottir and uh, now I will hand over the word to her to open the conference. Thank you very much. I'm only 87 so <laughs> I, I accept assistance in climbing stairs. Godan daginn, poli glottarar, og velkomin til Íslands. I have already translated, translated uh, your association into Icelandic. I call you poli glottarar. It's the plural of, uh, legal plural of uh, polyglots. I don't have to tell you that uh, uh, we are here in the country. It's difficult to, to, to speak after you, Sebastian. Okay. I hope this helps. In any case, you can put this. Don't believe a word Sebastian said. <laughs> <laughs> it's very embarrassing to, to listen to, to his... Um, uh, how do I say it? it was a very uh, word-rich uh, presentation that you made. But anyhow, I bid you all heartily welcome to Iceland. And I had to tell you about Iceland because I know there are so many here that can speak Iceland. And I was trying to learn how to do it. And I don't know if I can say it, but it's a very difficult topic in and uh, we are here in this country proud of having kept the oldest living language spoken in Europe and possibly in the world. I never for I forget to ask you about that, Sebastian. Is it in the world, the oldest living? How do you say how old is the language? Well, you, you can measure with the medieval literature, as we do. Uh, and the language of the medieval sagas, sometimes called the Latin of the North. But unlike Latin, it still flourishes today. And it does so because it is used not only to preserve the past, but to enable us to embrace modernity 
while also rejoicing in those differences that set us apart from the rest of the world. You, our guests here present, friends of languages, know of course that we Icelanders with our ancient language find it natural to translate modern times, to, to, to translate in modern times and inventions into transparent Icelandic. As Sebastian mentioned, television is Sjónvarp, the picture that is thrown out. Uh, they, are very, uh, they are very transparent, our, our, our uh, words, our new words. And uh, helicopter is Tirla, and a symbol for the rotation of the space. Computer is Tölva, inspired by the name of Völva, the soothsayer in the great medieval poetic Edda, Völuspá, the prophecy of uh, the CRS. Thus, new transparent words, easy uh, to understand, are adapted without hesitation. Instead of taking foreign uh, inexplic inexplicable expressions into the language. And I thank you for giving us a new word, polyglotterer. <laughs> what is the key uh, to the big world is a question I particularly uh, ask, uh, often ask uh, teenagers and very young people that are very much looking forward to the future. As a rule, their answers, they answer happily and cheerfully and confidently, money. <laughs> which, leads, uh, which leads to another question, how would you define money? The answer is inevitably with words. All, in all the different languages that are spoken on earth. Our different languages, wherever we are in the world, apart from uh, 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 they uh, define things, banks of memories and sustainable resources that we can draw upon to enrich our lives from today, today uh, and in the future. Language and the diversity of languages that coexist are the life force behind our knowledge of this world in general. We need words to express what we mean and what we feel, and to communicate what different generations leave to those who follow. And we are here, the followers. Similarity, similarly, we need multilingualism because we are living a time of globalization and of, and of awareness that every language is a different vehicle to express human identity and cultural diversity. And I wonder now why I was writing all this down. You are all talking out of your free mind. I want to tell you a story. In my day, uh, when I was, uh, let's say, when I was in, in gymnasium in, in uh, preparing for university, we had five languages in Iceland. It was obligatory for everyone. We had, of course, Icelandic. We had Dennis, of course, because we used to be under the rule of Dennis. We had German, we had French, and we had Latin. So uh, our, uh, we went out to life with, with all this, knowing at least something of these languages. And it has been an asset in life to have uh, learned, we were, we were made to learn by heart. I was telling to Sebastian the other day, I remember from a German, eine alte Dame auf eine Trapsesatz, <laughs> and uh, th things like that. And when I, those who are friends in the, in the audience, I remember my uh, examination where uh, my teacher, old teacher, French teacher, knew that I was going to France. And he asked me to, to uh, describe the word to be afraid. Craindre, craignant, craint. And I did that very consciously. Then he, he, he had, had his back to, to me, and then he suddenly turned around. And what is being afraid? And uh, whoever who knows French knows that it has nothing to do with craint, because it's our fur. And fortunately, I knew. I was so afraid that I knew that <laughs> our fur is our fur. Well, anyhow. Uh, uh, we need words to express uh, what we mean and what we feel and to communicate what different generations leave to those who follow. Similarly, we need multilingualism because we are living a time of globalization 
and uh, of awareness that uh, every language is a different vehicle to express human identity and cultural diversity. All languages are the shared heritage of humanity, essential not only for access to knowledge, but also for the development of understanding among peoples and dialogue for peace. You can hear that I have throughout my life always been reading speeches. <laughs> why, why didn't I know that you were so open and you were talking uh, without uh, having paper? Uh, <laughs> that, uh, I think that young people are, are, have more courage to, to lean on their own mind and their own capacity to speak openly. But we in my, my generation, my generation, we are not as sure of that. That is why we sometimes lack humor. <laughs> Sebastian mentioned it, that the promotion of multilingualism contributes to safe, uh, safeguarding are approximately 6,700. What is the number you have, Sebastian? I have 500, okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so open and uh, <laughs> want to give the languages a chance. Let's have it, 6,700. <laughs> National, regional, minority, and endangered languages, many of which are today uh, at great risk of disappearing. Icelandic is mercifully not yet deeply endangered. Ulvar, I hope that you listen to this, uh, to disappear, but we are very much afraid. We hear more and more English creeping into the language, and we have, for instance, a wonderful word for a moment. We have öknablik. It's, it's, it's a short moment when, when we eyelashes, uh, when we uh, use uh, we do it like this. Or antartak, it's the moment when we breathe. <sighs> That's moment in, in, in Icelandic. More and more I hear on the radio when people are, especially young people, they say uh, very clearly in Icelandic, beautiful Icelandic, suddenly comes, that was the moment. That was, that was the moment, that was the moment that I was me on this. That was the moment when I understood this. And uh, I think it's so, uh, so, so sad that uh, that uh, one language, only one language, is creeping into, into our old language. I wish it were Latin. <laughs> <laughs> but anything, anyhow, we appreciate very much the policy of the University of Iceland and other higher educational institution, institutions in our country to keep it alive as a language of science, technology, as well of uh, culture, by translating new concepts and coining native words for them. It's amazing uh, how the Icelanders continue, even, even younger people, trying to find uh, a, 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 an Icelandic word that can be declined or uh, verbs conjugated <coughs> for something that uh, is creeping uh, into the Nordic, into the Scandinavian languages. So they are very polluted by English, all the, all the Nordic languages. And uh, that is being lazy, not uh, to think of languages and how, how, we, how we meditate in, in languages. But um, uh, the University of Iceland has, has this, uh, this aim and this ambition to, to that uh, we should teach uh, all disciplines in, in Icelandic except the languages. Of course, we have to teach them in foreign languages. Uh, most of us up here in the north are doing our best safeguarding our ancient language and its treasures. There is no conflict between this and being part of the modern global community. These principles sustain each other. Ladies and gentlemen, herrar mínir og frúr, now I talk Icelandic, Veri velkomin til Íslands, again welcome to Iceland. Ég óska ykkur alls vel farnaðar hér heim og, og að þessi, þessi ráðstefna verði góð og gjöful fyrir ykkur og þið farið frá Íslandi með góðar minningar. Everybody understands that. 
<laughs> I wish you enjoyable and fruitful deliberations and declare open the Polygot Conference in Reykjavik 2017.